I want you to think for a moment about the town or community where you live or where you grew up. What are some things about that place that would be familiar to you? Maybe it's the school that you went to or your bank or maybe your favorite restaurant. And now imagine if war came to your community and you were forced to flee. And when you came back months later, there was nothing left. The school is gone. The restaurant has been destroyed. The grocery store has disappeared and your home is gone as well. Not only that, but you can't even find the site where your home used to be because the landscape has been rendered so unrecognizable. Well, that is the story of a village that used to be right here called Fleury, a village that died for France. I've moved just a, a little bit north of Fleury, and uh, we're going to be getting back there in just a little bit. But first, I wanted to give some context as to why Fleury found itself in such a disadvantageous position in June of 1916. So we've already talked about the fighting that took place at Fort Duamont in an earlier episode. Um, in February of 1916, the opening phase of the battle, uh, it falls to the Germans in June, early June, I think June 7th of 1916. Uh, Fort Vaux had also fallen to the Germans. And this pushed the line a little bit further south, and the Germans were really looking to capitalize on that success and continue pushing south to take the high ground above Verdun. Now, newly arrived to the battlefield were men from the German Alpen Corps. This was an elite group of mountain troops who had been fighting in the area of uh, like around Macedonia and Serbia and uh, they had recently been redeployed to the Verdun sector. Well, on the night of June 22nd, they set out from Fort Duamont, which is behind me, and started making their way south, probably snaking their way through trenches like the one that I'm in right now. And at midnight, when it rolled over to June 23rd, well, German artillery started just hammering the French positions to the south. So if you had been one of these German troops right here, well, there, there would have been artillery just sailing over your head and it must have sounded like the gates of hell had just opened up. And by 3 a.m., they were at their jumping off point, which is uh, right up here where I'm heading. So I'm just driving along here and uh, yeah, just uh, made a new friend. Uh, that dude does not have a care in the world.
We've moved down the road a little bit, and obviously we are next to the cemetery here at Duamont. Uh, so Fort Duamont, just to reposition ourselves, is off in that direction. Uh, on the early in the early morning hours of the, the 23rd, uh, German troops, along with that fox, would have been making their way in this direction, and they would have slammed into French troops right about here. Uh, so this is the position of uh, what is called Abri 320. My French is terrible, so I probably mispronounced that, but it roughly translates to uh, Shelter 320. And uh, again, the, the 130th uh, Infantry Division would have been positioned all along kind of this line right here. This would have been the, the left flank, uh, which I think was held by the 39th Infantry Regiment. And as with so many places here at Verdun, I mean, it is just chewed up with artillery fire here. I mean, there are just pock marks all over the place. And there doesn't appear to be much of the shelter left. I'm going to see if I can find anything besides these two uh, concrete structures. Man, just look at this. I'm telling you, you, you get down here and you start walking among all of these shell craters. It is just beyond imagination. Uh, I cannot even comprehend what it must have been like to have been under this German heavy artillery fire uh, at any point, really, during this battle. I've read accounts from soldiers who, who talk about what it's like to uh, be on the receiving end of an artillery barrage. And they, they said it about drives you completely mad because you, you don't have any control. Like you, you just have to sit there and take it. And uh, this grave that we're walking up on here, this is the grave of a man named Jean Legris. Again, my French is really bad, so I think that I pronounced that right. Uh, but this was a French machine gunner who held the line here against the onslaught of Bavarian troops who were attacking on the 23rd and uh, died right here. Okay, I think I may have found where an opening is for this thing. And, yep. Okay, so here is where one of the openings for this shelter was located. And uh, I, I read that under the German artillery barrage, like this kept getting uh, basically caved in. And the you know, French soldiers would have to dig out their buddies and then it would, uh, you know, cave in and, and collapse again. But uh, yeah, it must have been awful. And then after... Uh, the Germans overran this position. They ended up using it as like a, a supply depot or another jumping off point. All right, anyway, we're going to head back into the direction of Fleury now. I've moved back into Fleury now, and the I, I believe it was the 239th Infantry Regiment, uh, French Infantry Regiment, had taken a position uh, right on the outskirts of Fleury. And, and when these Germans rolled through, uh, they, they just bowled these guys over. I think there were only two companies that were here. Prior to that, there was a huge artillery barrage and mortar barrage that hit Fleury. 
and it was indiscriminate about what it was hitting. Buildings, road network, water supply, anything. Uh, this town got hit hard and uh, the, the Germans just pushed right through here as they were trying to, uh, again, attain this key position above the city of Verdun. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're gonna take a look around here and uh, see what's left. If I haven't mentioned it already, this is my first time stepping foot on this ground. Uh, Chris from Vlogging Through History highly recommended this place. Uh, I've had some others who told me that if I come to Verdun, uh, of course, I have to come to Fleury. Uh, this is right on top of the Dumont Plateau. So uh, this poor village was really just kind of in the eye of the storm. And man, I don't know if you can really tell it on camera but it is unbelievable how chewed up this ground is and I, I think they've recently come through and did some clear cutting which seeing all of these stumps and branches lying about really kind of adds to the effect in a way um, it, it feels old, but at the same time, still feels uh, a little bit fresh, seeing all of these, these stumps here, as if, you know, I myself am one of these villagers coming back. But yeah, just shell craters everywhere. As you make your way through Flurry, Obviously, there are no structures left, uh, but there are some markers that tell us where things used to be. So, for example, right here is where the Bauernhof farm used to stand. Not sure what they would have had or what they would have grown, but uh, they had a home and a farm right here. Right here is where the parsonage stood. So... The local priest or preacher uh, would have had his home right here. This shell crater is where the village bakery would have stood. So you can imagine living here prior to 1916. Maybe in the morning the, the smell of bread would have wafted through your window. But after the war came to flurry, uh, the smell of fresh baking bread uh, was replaced with the smell of gunpowder and cordite and the dead. The village of Fleury also had a church that was destroyed in the battle along with all of the other buildings. And uh, back here where you can see all of the pockmarks from artillery, well that's where Church Street was. And the only building that is here when you come to Fleury is this chapel. Now, obviously, this was built in later years and wasn't, um, wasn't here during the, the battle itself. Something else that's pretty interesting about Fleury is it still maintains communal status in France, even though it has a population of zero. And uh, the village of Fleury also has a mayor, uh, which is uh, considered to be a, a pretty honorary title. I know that I keep saying this, but man, this is just so sad. Uh, here we're looking at a spot where the local wine grower had his vineyard, maybe. Or maybe that's just where he lived. Uh, and then if we continue on down, let's see what we have here. Oh, this is where the plumber lived. And it looks... Like there might be some of the foundation of this home left in this bomb crater. Huh. So walking around here, that's the first time I've seen that. Wow. Right here is where the, the lavoir, or the, the wash house, would have been. So women in the community 
would have gathered at this spot and I'm seeing some more like foundation remains here. I'm guessing that might have been the lavoir. But any women, anyway, women from the community uh, would have gathered here to wash clothes and uh, and socialize and visit with each other. But yeah, this is what they came back to. I've had the opportunity to travel to a lot of different battlefields, whether it's Revolutionary War or the Civil War, a little bit World War I, uh, quite a few World War II battlefields. And of all the places I've been, they all hit just a little bit different. I, I've never been to a place just like this that has the, the feeling of loss like what Flurry does. I can't help as I'm walking around here just thinking about what it would be like to, to come back to my own home and see it destroyed. And then to have that grief multiplied when everyone in my community and family has had their homes and businesses destroyed as well. I mean, right here is where a school used to be. Um, yeah, it, it definitely puts an exclamation point on just how awful war really is. And it's not just the people on the front line who suffer. Uh, it's, it's everyone who collectively suffers. Anyway, just one of the things that I'm thinking about, walking through Fleury, population zero, a village that died for France. Mm -hmm. 